last speaker today uh, is Anke Giner Mathieu. She's going to speak about higher debt traces and classification of show motives. Merci. Alors, juste une phrase en français pour vous remercier pour l'invitation. Je suis très heureuse d'être ici et, et de parler dans cette salle que j'ai fréquentée comme auditrice quand j'étais étudiante en thèse il y a quelques années. <rire> voilà. Et puis en plus à cette occasion pour ce, ce colloque en l'honneur de, de Tite. Um, okay, so my talk is uh, based on a joint work with uh, Charles de Clerc, and the objects we are interested in are uh, two motifs of some projective homogeneous varieties, and the main result I would like to explain is a classification uh, theorem for those uh, two motifs. And um, after that, I would like to give, give you a new proof of a result of de Klerk, which is uh, about motivic equivalence for algebraic groups. So we'll explain what it means later. And I will try and explain that we can characterize it using uh, what I will call Tietz P indexes, which is a variant of the uh, usual classical uh, Tietz P indexes for uh, algebraic groups. So let me start with uh, some notations. So I'm working over base field F. P is a prime number. Lambda will be Z or Z mod P. So I will start with Z coefficients and I will explain why and when I switch to a Z mod P uh, coefficients. And I use a notation mod F lambda for the category of two motifs over F uh, with coefficients in lambda. And um, so I will also use the word uh, variety for smooth projective variety over the field uh, F. So all my varieties are smooth and uh, projective. And if you are given such a variety, you can associate to it. So if X is a variety in this sense, you can associate to it an object, M of X in this category, which is called the motive of X. So when I use this word, I always mean two motive with coefficients in uh, lambda. And of course, the easiest object you can think of is the motif of a point. And you can shift it by some integers for some i in z. So we have a notation for those, which is z i, and they are called tape motifs. Okay. So that's a setting I will use throughout my uh, talk. And I would like to start with uh, some examples of motivic decompositions. If I use uh, Tietz's words, uh, je vais essayer de rendre cet objet un peu plus palpable pour ceux d'entre vous qui ne le connaîtraient pas uh, dans, dans cette première partie. So, um, It, one of the benefits, I mean, when you work with varieties, we don't have a lot of morphisms between varieties. We don't have a nice structure on the category. And one of the benefits of going from varieties to this category is that this one is a pseudo-abelian category. So in this category, you can study additive decompositions and you can study them by making some cycle computations. So concretely, if you have a variety X, If you look at the diagonal in x times x, this is a cycle, and if you can write it as a sum of cycles which are orthogonal and uh, pairwise orthogonal and idempotent for the cycle uh, composition, you get a motivic decomposition. So you can think of the motif of a variety as an object which still contains some information about the geometry of the variety, but which Uh, can be decomposed, and, and it's a nice way of uh, catching this information, in a sense. And um, so, to show you some very explicit and, and very easy examples, so the first one is already in Manin's paper, so this is in 1969, and Manin explains that the motif of P to the N is very easy to describe. It's a sum of shifts of the motif of a point, 
So with our notation, it's going to be Z0 plus Z1 plus etc. plus Zn. And uh, this is, of course, a reflect of the fact that this variety has a cellular structure. Okay? And uh, because of that, the same kind of result holds true for any split uh, projective homogeneous varieties. So this is in a paper of uh, Koch from uh, 1991, I think. So what he proved is if G over F is a split uh, semi-simple group, And of course, the word split is important here. X is a G projective homogeneous variety, so for some parabolic P in G. Then you can still write the motif of X as a sum of shifts of a, say, okay, a sum of lambda ZI for some I in Z. So you have the same kind of decomposition, and such a motif is called split. Uh, I, maybe I will also say it's a pure tet motif. It's a sum of shifts of the motif of a point. So that's a pretty easy example. Now, I will show you another example, which is more or less on, on the other side of the story, and which is much deeper, because it's about an anisotropic variety, and it's due to rust. So this is from uh, 1998. So we we'll start from a very classical algebraic object. Take uh, elements A1, AN in F star. And I'm assuming characteristic different from two here, just for my uh, writing. And I consider a quadratic form, which is a tensor product of 1 minus AI for i between 1 and n. So this is what is called an n-fold Pfister form. It's a very important object in quadratic form theory. And for instance, such a form is either anisotropic or split. And the same holds for the corresponding uh, algebraic groups. And um, in this form, you can find another form, which is denoted by phi n, which is pi n minus 1 plus minus a n with obvious notation. I mean, this is the same as above, but with uh, n minus 1 values. So this one has dimension 2 to the n. This one has dimension 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1. And so Rost provided a motivic decomposition for the motif of the corresponding projective quadrix. I will write x pi n and x phi n for the corresponding projective quadrix. And so maybe I will uh, write a statement, and then I will try and uh, explain why I think it's uh, interesting. So what Rost proved is uh, there exists an object. So I'm going to assume that they are anisotropic. And so Rost proved there is an object in this motivic category which is indecomposable and satisfying the following. So the motif of the Pfister quadric is just a sum of shifts of this object R. So you have R plus R shifted by 1 plus etc. plus R shifted by D. And the motif of the other one, which is called the norm quadric, uh, starts with the same motif R, and it's really the same. With, uh, I mean, phi n is a subform in pi n here. So it's really the same R. And then you have another object, which is the motif of a quadric. And this quadric is the pure subform in pi n minus 1. So the notations here. Um, so pi n minus 1 has a diagonalization which starts with 1. And this is a complement form. 
and D is the dimension of the norm quadric. So it's 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. And R, uh, so this object R, is called the host motif. Okay, now a few comments on, on this object. Um, so I wanted to show it to you for several reasons. Uh, the first one is, I hope this is going to provide some motivation for being interested in uh, Chaux motifs of projective homogeneous varieties. And the reason is the following. So uh, as you know, there is this uh, Milner's conjecture, which was proved by Wojvodsky, which builds a bridge between quadratic form theory, uh, Galois cohomology mod 2 and K theory modulo 2. And the n fold piston form here corresponds uh, in these isomorphisms to the symbol A1, AN in K theory or in Galois cohomology. And in fact, the host motif played a very important role in Wojvodsky's proof of uh, Milner's conjecture. So that's a very important object, and this decomposition uh, is really an important result in this uh, direction. And um, so that's the first uh, thing. And the second thing I wanted to emphasize is. Uh, so I will show you later other decompositions that I will use, uh, which are for isotropic varieties. But I wanted to emphasize that uh, there is a real gap between that kind of result, which really follows from cellular decomposition of the varieties, and this one, which is much harder because we are in the anisotropic case. And in a sense, our main theorems, the criterion theorems that I will explain, uh, enable us to avoid dealing with the anisotropic case in some situations. So that's one of the things I would like to uh, try and explain. Okay, so that was uh, the starting point. Now I will come to the criterion. So I need some uh, preparation for this. Um, okay, uh, so first of all, our purpose is we, we intend to classify motifs of projective homogeneous varieties. That's the general goal. And that's a very nice result in this direction, which is due to Vishik. So Vishik in... Uh, ah, 2000, I think. Uh, proved uh, uh, the following result for quadrics. So assume you are given two quadratic forms, Q and Q prime over F. I always assume the forms are non-degenerate so that the corresponding quadrics are, are smooth and the result also holds in a characteristic two. So Fitz would be happy about that, of course. Uh, so you take two quadratic forms, assume they have the same dimension. And then uh, Vishik proved that the motifs are isomorphic if and only if for any extension of your base field, the quadratic forms have the same Vit index. So this is my notation for the Vit index. So the number of hyperbolic planes you can put in, uh, in your form. Uh, so when this occurs, we say that the forms have the same higher heat index. That's uh, where the word higher comes from. And uh, this gives you a very nice characterization of motivic equivalence for quadrics in terms of this invariant, which is an algebraic uh, invariant, in a, in a sense. Sorry. Oh, it's both. So Vishik proved the result. Okay. Uh, so. As I, I wanted to say it later, but I can say it now. Vishik proved the result uh, using Wojvodsky motifs, and he's, I think he's working with co integral coefficients. But anyway, for quadrics, there is a theorem due to Olivier Ossion, which more or less says that you can work with Z coefficients or Z mod 2 coefficients, and it's the same story. From now on, and that's a good point for this, I think I'm going to switch to finite coefficients, and uh, I will explain why. But this you can sync with Z or Z mod 2 coefficients. Sorry? 
Yeah, so if, if, for, for quadrics, yeah, you, you, the, the interesting prime is two, if you want to work with finite coefficients. But the theorems I will set are still valid, but they're completely uh, useless. So from now on, I take lambda to be z mod p, and uh, p is going to be 2 very often, but not always for some exceptional groups, or sometimes you can also be interested in other values of p. And um, what else? I'm going to restrict the category I'm working in, so I won't give you the best possibility, but uh, let me write mod f ph lambda. ph is a, for projective homogeneous. So this is a full uh, tet. Uh, yeah. So this is a full tet pseudo abelian subcategory. In uh, my motivic category. which is generated by motifs of G projective homogeneous varieties where G over, for, for, for all, uh, no, not G, maybe, by projective homogeneous varieties under some algebraic group defined over, if you take all possible groups, all possible varieties, so an object here typically is a sum of shifts of direct summons of motifs of some projective homogeneous varieties under some groups, all this defined over F. That's the kind of objects we look at. And um, why do we do this? Because in this category, we have a very nice theorem due to Karpenko. And uh, following previous result by uh, Chernusov and Merkuriev, which says that we have a Kruhl-Schmidt type property in this category. So any object in uh, this category decomposes uniquely as a sum of indecomposable objects. Um, no, no, um, no, no, I think I'm working with uh, smooth complete schemes. I'm working in the framework as it described in uh, Elman Karpenko Merkoyev book. So, uh, okay, and um, so what this tells you, of course, uniquely means up to um, permutation of the summons and isomorphism of the summons. But up to those operations, you have a unique decomposition as a sum of uh, indecomposable, which is not true in general with Z coefficients. So that's one motivation for going from switching to finite coefficients. And uh, it's not true, uh, it's not known whether or not it's true for arbitrary varieties. It's known in, in a slightly more general context, but it is true for uh, in this context here. And with this in hand, you can define an invariant which uh, I will call the Tate trace, which, um, uh, is there any remark? Yeah, okay. Which is in that paper with, uh, with Charles. So uh, the Tate trace of an object P in this category is a pure tet summons of maximal rank, and I will show you some example in a second. So what it, what it means is the following: you have your object, you decompose it as indecomposables, uh, you delete, you you uh, keep all the indecomposable summons which are tet motifs, shifts of the motif of a point and you forget the other ones, and you get an object which I will call the Tate twist. And this is easy to compute, at least in one case, uh, namely for quadrix. Uh, again, thanks to a theorem of Rost. So it's an example. 
So let me assume again Q over F is a non degenerate quadratic form. Um, so what uh, Rost proved is the following. So uh, if the quadric is isotropic, if you have a hyperbolic plane, then the motif has two tet summons with shift zero and D. And uh, if you induct this, you get in the end a motivic decomposition, which is a reflect of the Witt decomposition of the form. So if Q decomposes as a certain number of hyperbolic planes plus an, an isotropic form, so this is a Witt decomposition, Then what Rost proved is that the motif of XQ is as follows. So you have shifts of the motif of a point up to dimension. Uh, sorry, now it should be lambda. And my lambda is Z mod 2. Oh, it's the same for quadrics, but let me try and be consistent. I take P equals 2 here. OK, this plus lambda v index minus 1. Then you have the motif of the anisotropic quadric shifted by uh, I naught. And then you have, again, some uh, pet motifs. Like this. Okay. So already we know that the tet twist contains all this. I mean, those are tet summons, those are tet summons. And um, it's also known when the tet twist is zero or non-zero. And this depends on whether, I mean, at least for varieties, it depends on whether the variety has a zero cycle of degree prime to p or not. So it's a lemma that I will use later, that the motif of x has non-zero twist. if and only if x has a zero cycle of degree 1 modulo p. And in our situation, we have p equals 2. A zero cycle of degree 1 modulo 2 means a rational point over some odd degree extension. And for quadric, because of Springer's theorem, it's only possible if the quadric is isotropic. So this tells you, by Springer, that the tet trace of the motif of the anisotropic quadric is zero. And so you get that the tet trace of the motif of the quadric is just the sum of, uh, so for k equals zero to v index minus one of lambda k plus lambda d minus k. So we have a very um, explicit description. And uh, what you see is that in the case of quadric, the tet trace is very, uh, it's the same kind of information as the VIT index. If you know the tet twist, you know the VIT index and conversely. But the tet twist is defined in this uh, border context and we are going to use it to uh, state a classification uh, theorem. So, so I'm still having uh, lambda z mod p. I'm going to write it for projective homogeneous varieties. So let me assume P is prime uh, for I equals 1, 2. I'm assuming that XI is GI projective homogeneous. And I'm also assuming that G1 and G2 are groups of inner type. Possibly different. I will switch to something else now. Um, I mean, they could be of different type. It doesn't matter. Then the theorem says that the motif of x1 is isomorphic to the motif of x2 in mod f lambda. If and only if uh, they have exactly the same tet trace over any extension of the base field. Did 
jeg godt i at... Okay. Okay. So, um, I would like to make a few uh, comments about this uh, statement before I keep going. So, this quaternion is a generalization of a Vichy's quaternion. If you apply it to quadrics, you get Vichy's theorem. And we did not use Vichy's theorem in the proof. The proof is uh, uh, independent. Another thing which is, uh, I think, quite important is that our proof doesn't use at all the classification of algebraic groups. It's not a type-by-type -type proof. And as I said earlier, G1 and G2 could be of different type. It doesn't matter. The theorem is valid in, uh, in this context. Uh, maybe I will tell you what is a key tool of the proof. So a key tool is uh, the theory of upper motifs, which was developed by uh, Carpenko. And uh, another thing um, I would like to say is, uh, so the proof uses, uh, besides Carpenko's result, so, I mean, I don't know how to prove this theorem directly. I know how to prove a stronger theorem. Actually, the result holds for all objects in, uh, you take the full subcategory in mod f lambda, as I had before, generated by uh, shifts of summons of, uh, and sums of motifs of projective uh, varieties and the groups of inner type. And in this category, the result holds for any object. So there is a stronger result. You can also compare summons in different motifs using this theorem just by comparing the uh, tate traces. And another thing which I will try and explain in, in the second part of my talk is uh, uh, one thing which I find quite intriguing and, and remarkable in a sense is that, as I said, motivic decompositions are harder to find in the anisotropic case. And the anisotropic case, it's not exactly, well, we have zero cycles instead of rational points, but roughly speaking, you will see this working in the next uh, part. The anisotropic case is the case where the tate trace is zero. So with this theorem, to compare some motifs, it's enough to compare the tate traces, and when they're non-zero, you are not in the anisotropic case. And I think this is one reason why this result might be useful in, uh, in some situations. And now I will um, try and explain a proof of a uh, de Klerk theorem on motivic equivalence for algebraic groups using this uh, result. Does P have to be invertible? Sorry? Does P have to be invertible in F? No, no, it works for, for um, quadratic forms in our characteristic too. I think it's okay. <laughs> Sorry? P in our type. Yes. So. Uh, okay, I, I will stick to groups of inner type in my lecture, but the result probably holds, uh, the result holds the same for groups of P inner type, which means they become inner over some uh, P power extension. And there is a uh, joint work in progress with uh, Nikita and Charles on working on the outer case. So maybe more things to come later, I don't know, but uh, on the general case. But. No, it works for, for instance, it works for groups of type uh, uh, dn. So if you take this, the orthogonal group of a quadratic form, it becomes inner over quadratic extension, and you have p equals 2. p inner means the group becomes inner over p power extension. So dn case works, for instance. I mean, I, uh, if you really want to see this as a generalization of Vichy's theorem, you need this. But, uh, p? Uh, well, we can discuss this later, maybe. I, I yeah. <laughs> and if for classical groups, we're going to have p equals 2. And I'll stick to inner case in my lecture. OK. Um, OK, so now I'd like to talk about motivic equivalence for algebraic groups. So what is the idea here and, and what kind of questions are we interested in? So this is, uh, the, the result is, uh, came before the theorem I just uh, stated. Um, it's, uh, if you have two groups now, which I'm going to assume are the same type, then you can identify the Dinkin diagrams and you can 
identify protective homogeneous varieties and we would like to find a condition under which all protective homogeneous varieties have isomorphic motifs. And this condition can be expressed using the notion of Tietz P index, which I uh, will uh, introduce now. So I will um, write down an example to make sure. Uh, yeah. Okay, so assume you are given a uh, G is PGO plus of Q, and I'm going to assume it has type DN1. So the form has dimension 2N and trivial discriminant. So Dinkin diagram looks like this. I'm making a bit long, so I can write the, the index. And uh, if it is isotropic, it means the quadratic form is uh, isotropic. And in that case, the index looks like this. So the so-called vertices are 1, 2, 3, up to I0, which is the width index. So in general, you take a split torus in a maximal torus in G. Uh, so you have, I, I will write delta G for the, the a set of simple roots uh, for the group G. And so I'm skipping all the details because you, you know this better than I do, I guess. But uh, I will write delta G D for the set of distinguished uh, elements, so the set of alpha in delta G such that alpha restricted to S is non-zero. So in this case, I have delta G D equals one to up to I naught. Okay, so, so those are the distinguished elements in uh, the Tietz index. And uh, it's well known, so that's what I have to be precise about. I'm using uh, the relation, the convention I'm using for varieties is uh, I'm thinking in terms of flag varieties rather than subgroups. So X1G is the quadric XQ, which means X, in X empty set is a spec F, and X delta is a variety of complete flags of Borel subgroups. So with these conventions, you have that alpha is distinguished if and only if X alpha G has a rational point. But uh, when you look at motifs, you can't detect rational points, but you do detect zero cycles of degree prime to P using the Tate trace. So because of that, I will define the Tietz P index by saying that alpha is in delta G D P, it's P distinguished, if and only if X alpha G has uh, uh, zero cycle of degree one mod P. So in other words, you can think of the Tietz P index as the union of, I mean, so this distinguished sub P subset as a union of the distinguished subset for G over the best field and over all prime to P extensions of the best field. And you can also define it as, uh, sorry. Okay, maybe I'll write the example here. Uh, you can also define it as follows. So if you look at the case of quadrics, if you take P equals two, then as we said before, this is the same as uh, the distinguished subset. But if P is odd, then I guess you get, uh, the whole set. This is why p equals 2 is the interesting prime here. If you allow uh, any prime to p extension here, you allow quadratic extensions, you can split your group by quadratic extensions, and so everything is going to be distinguished after this process. Okay? So it's just the same idea as the Tietz index, but you allow prime to p extensions. That's the uh, okay. And with this uh, tool in hand, so uh, the Clark theorem can be stated as follows. So now I'm taking G1, G2 of the same inner type. I fix an identification between the Dinkin diagrams.
which is really important if you think of groups of type D4-1, for instance, then you really have to uh, think about it. And uh, the following conditions are equivalent. So condition one says as for all theta in delta G1, which is a set of vertices of the Dinkin diagram, the varieties x theta G1 and x phi of theta G2 have the same uh, motifs, have isomorphic motifs. And this is equivalent to saying that uh, the tit space indexes are the same using this identification phi, phi for all extension of the base field. So for all E over F, uh, the, the P distinguished classes in the tits index of G1 over E is mapped by phi to the P distinguished classes of G2 over E. That's uh, what the statement says. Okay, and my goal now is to try and explain the proof uh, of this result using our uh, isomorphism of a criterion. Okay, so it's a quite, uh, I mean, this state, both statements are quite strong. So roughly speaking, if you forget about this phi and so on, what it says is if the two groups have exactly the same kind of isotropy over all extensions of your base field up to extensions of degree prime to P, then uh, for any subset theta, the corresponding projective homogeneous varieties have isomorphic motifs, and conversely. Okay, so how can you prove such a result? Okay, so uh, the interesting part, I will explain how we can prove that two implies one, which is the hard part. One implies two is almost by definition of the tits index and, and by the characterization I, I gave earlier. So, uh, and uh, the argument we are going to use here, we are going to use some induction on the rank of the group. And um, so let me assume that uh, so the result is known in small rank, and I have G1 and G2, and I assume they satisfy condition two, and I pick theta in, okay. I'm going to uh, forget about phi, so I'm going to really identify the Dinkin diagram with some phi, and I pick a theta in delta, which is my notation for delta G1 and delta G2. I'm a bit, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, what you want to prove is that the varieties x theta g1 and x theta g2 are isomorphic, have isomorphic motifs. And because of our criterion, it is enough to check that they have the same tape trace over any extension of your base field. So I'm going to show you how you can check it over f, and then you can apply the same strategy over any extension of f, because this condition, of course, is for any extension, and then you will get the result. And the first case, which should be the hard case, is if both varieties have no zero cycle of degree one in mode P. So if theta G1 and X theta G2 have no zero cycle of degree one mode P. So if you are in this situation, um, we don't have a lot of tools because this might be the anisotropic case, but we know that the tetris is zero because of the lemma I stated at the very beginning. This is exactly the case when the tetris is zero for both varieties. So they have the same tetris. So that was the easy case in a sense. And I don't know where to write. I don't want to erase anything. Uh, okay, maybe I will erase this. So otherwise, uh, this is not going to work. This is, the body is too small. Um, maybe I can erase the statement. I'm sure you all have the statement in mind. Right? So I, this is what I have to prove using the tape twists. And the second case is 
I'm going to assume that one of the two varieties has a zero cycle of degree one mod p. Let's say x1, for instance. Assume x uh, theta g1 has a zero cycle of degree one mod p. So it means it has a rational point over some prime to p extension of your base field. And in that case, what you can do is uh, the following. So I'm going to extend scalars to a p-spatial closure, let's say f tilde of f, um, which is, so this is an algebraic extension of f, uh, such that all extensions of f tilde have p power degree. And the intermediate extensions, which are finite over f, have prime to p degree. In the perfect case, you just take a p silo subgroup in the absolute Galois group, and you take the fixed point. And there is a construction in general. So you extend scalars to this field. Now, the variety has a zero cycle of degree 1 over the best field, so it also does over f tilde. But f tilde has no prime to p extension. So the point is over f tilde, this is the same as having a rational point. So you know that over f tilde, x theta has a rational point, uh, g1. Which means theta is contained in the distinguished subset for g1. And for the same reason, because the field is p-special, doesn't have prime to p extension anymore, this is the same as the tits uh, pay distinguished subset. Uh, so this is over f tilde, of course, g1 over f tilde, which is equal by our condition 2 to the same thing for g2, okay? which is again equal to delta d uh, g2 f tilde. And uh, so what we have is the groups are isotropic and the varieties are isotropic. We are in the isotropic case. And then we can use a motivic decomposition, which is due to uh, Chernusov, Merkuriev, and uh, Giller. Ternus of Stephen Gille and uh, Merkuriev. And uh, maybe I will explain it here. So here we have the set one. Okay, one is contained in, uh, I'm assuming I naught is greater or equal to one. So one is contained in the distinguished subset for G. And uh, Rost theorem says that the motif of XQ decomposes as Z0 plus the motif of XQ prime plus ZD if you write Q as H plus Q prime. Okay. And the important fact here is that so we have two copies of the motif of spec F and one copy of the motif of XQ prime and all three are projective homogeneous under G prime which is uh, the semi-simple part of a Levy subgroup of the parabolic defined over f because of this assumption. So you can play exactly the same game here. We have a subset theta which is distinguished. So because of that, uh, you can, I mean, the, what they prove is that the motif of x theta gi for i equals 1 or 2, and I'm over f tilde, I'm not going to write f tilde everywhere, but I'm over f tilde, those motifs uh, has a decomposition as a sum for x in x of motif of zx shifted by lx. And this is a purely combinatorial formula. Meaning uh, the combinatorics of the group tells you what kind of varieties are going to occur, what is this set, and what, what kind of shifts we are going to take. So it's really combinatorial. The only thing is that the Z, it's going to be Zi, and those are projective homogeneous under Gi prime, which is again the semi-simple part of a Levy subgroup of the parabolic, uh, given by the fact that theta is distinguished in your group. Okay, and now we are almost done because. Uh, what is known is that the uh, Dinkin diagrams for G1 prime and G2 prime is obtained from the Dinkin diagrams of G1 and G2 by deleting the vertices which are in theta. 
So those two groups satisfy condition two in my theorem. Condition uh, one or two, I don't remember. Anyway, the condition on the Tietz indexes, I mean, they have their inner twisted form of the same split group, and they have the same index over any extension of F tilde, because the index is obtained just by uh, keeping the distinguished subset are distinguished for those groups if they are for GI. Okay, so the condition on the GIs gives you that those groups satisfy the same condition. So the ZIX for I equals 1, 2 have isomorphic motifs. And because of that, those have isomorphic motifs over F tilde. So they are isomorphic over F tilde. Now, there is a lemma which is not so hard to prove, which tells you that if they are isomorphic over F tilde, they have the same tight trace. And this descends to F. So you can go down to F and you can deduce from this that they have the same tight trace over the best field. Now you repeat the process of any extension of F and you do get that uh, the result holds uh, the, the, by induction. Uh, so this provides uh, proofs uh, the, the, the theorem that I mentioned. I will finish, I have just two minutes so I won't write it, but I have to say just one, this one, more, thing, one more thing I would like to say. If you think about quadrix, uh, if you combine uh, De Klerk's theorem and Vichy's theorem, you can observe the following things. Assume two quadrix have isomorphic motifs. Then the corresponding quadratic form have the same Vit index over any extension of the base field. Hence, the corresponding groups are motivic equivalent. And this tells you that actually all other projective homogeneous varieties have isomorphic motifs which is a very strong property. It tells you that the motif of the quadric is enough to, to determine the motifs of the other projective homogeneous varieties. So this uh, leads to uh, another work, uh, which is joined with uh, Charles de Klerk and uh, Maxim Zikovic, in which we introduced a notion of critical varieties. So the question is, can we find a subset theta such that if the motifs are isomorphic for these subsets, for two groups uh, of the same inner type, uh, then all other varieties also have isomorphic motifs. And so you can prove that such a thing exists, for instance, for all classical groups for p equals 2. And I think this new theorem sheds a new light on it. I mean, in a sense, what we look for is a subset theta such that the motif of x theta determines the Tietz p index. And if you have such a thing, then you get a critical variety. And you know it's enough to look at one variety to have the motivic isomorphism class of all other varieties. And I think it's time to stop. Thank you.